from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This is the First Nations of Australia Writers um, Network presentation. Um, Yamagaraninda, welcome. Australia is, uh, for those who may not know um, much about Aboriginal people, um, we have the oldest continuing cultures in the world. There are over 300 or more language groups with around five or 600 dialects in those groups. Um, we, Australia is around the size of the United States. Um, so you can see it's quite a, a large area and quite diverse. Um, our people have a, a very long and strong history. Um, very, we, our language, uh, the arts were a very important part of our um, being. And, you know, in fact, um, uh, we, I guess we, we exchanged information and we told people, um, not just people, but we, our stories came out. And, and the oral storytelling is an important part of Aboriginal culture. And um, we see writing as an extension of those oral cultures. So I'm going to just introduce you. I've, my head's still on the last panel, sorry. Um, we've got a great panel here today of three of our, um, our writers. Um, we've got Dub Leffler, who's just sitting here with me. Who's, um, I'm going to get these guys to talk a little bit about themselves and introduce them because they've got, everybody's got a really interesting story and we all come from different countries. We call them countries. If you are in the last session... Janine explained to you that country doesn't mean like the United States or Australia. We when we say the word country, it means where our ancestors walked, lived, and where we come out of that environment because Aboriginal people are so intrinsically entwined with the environment that um, when we say we're on country is when, you know, we say we go, we're going home to country. So it's when we're going back to where... And we may not have ever lived on that country, but that's where our ancestors came from. I'm Cathy Craigie, the Executive Director of First Nations, and uh, we're extremely um, honoured to be here um, and to um, let you know a little bit about us. I first off wanted to acknowledge the, um, a part of our tradition, and it's actually been enshrined now into um, not only the political system in Australia, but public life in Australia. We start everything off with what we call a welcome to country or an acknowledgement of country. And we like to still do that when we go anywhere in the world. And that, that acknowledge, I can't do a welcome because this is not my country, but I'm doing acknowledgement. And that's to the First Nations people here um, in America, but particularly around the Washington area. I have a huge list I won't go through. Probably most of you would know these names. Piscataway, um, Mataponi, Monikan, um, Nataway. Um, rapper, I can't pronounce half these names, but just to acknowledge that um, we um, acknowledge their ancestors and thank um, you know the ancestors for allowing us to come onto this country. We also, in part of our welcome and acknowledgement, we acknowledge all the elder, older people in the the room, the grandparents the aunties and uncles, and um, they are the keepers of the wisdom and they pass that down. So we never, ever um, do anything publicly without acknowledging the older people in the room um, because we wouldn't be here apart from that, but also our knowledge and wisdom comes from them. So we'll start off um, getting these three to introduce themselves. Dub, I might get you to just get a quick description of your country, where you come from, um, a little bit about you, and then we'll move on and then come back and talk a little bit about literature and... Uh, Dub Leffler. Yes. Uh, uh, so before before I do that, I... Um, can everybody hear me? Can you understand my Australian accent? And if we speak too fast, signal us. <laughs> so if I say, you understand that, you... Yeah, you're all with me. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I have to honour the, the old energy that is here and the, and the true energy and, uh, and the people that are uh, in touch are with that energy. And uh, because uh, we, are, we are here mixing with that energy. And if you have the right ear, 
then you can be in touch with that. And uh, so whenever I'm on another person's country, their land, you know, I, I strive to leave the best resonance possible and something that is in accordance with them. And so I, my story is, uh, it's split into two. So I, um, uh, I don't want to take up too much time, I guess. I think if we just tell, uh, we'd like to introduce, because I want to show you that we're quite diverse. There is no one generic um, image, look. Um, all Aboriginal people are different. The culture, one culture from another is different, although we all have common areas. So if you could just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Bigamble people. Yeah, so uh, my name is Dubler, I'm a Capricorn. I like uh, <laughs> walking on the... Walking in the rain of <laughs> pina coladas. Um, yeah, I... I uh, so I come from uh, people called the Bigambul people, and uh, we are rare people. Um, uh, the, yeah, there was a war that's not often talk, talked about. We, we, so we touched on it. That, that uh, it was fought for 14 years, and it was between 1840 and 1854. And after that war, and that was with the, the settlers, the, the, the stealers, um, we, there was 100 big and bull left, and I am descended from that 100. So it is, you know, it is with great honour that I speak for those people. And uh, I can safely say that you will never meet another person uh, of big and bull descent. Me. Well, other than... You know, to, to rephrase, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we are that rare. And I'm honoured that uh, everyone here in this room has come to, to listen to our, to our story. And, yes, yeah, so I'm an, an author and illustrator of children's books. Uh, I've illustrated over um, 20 books and have worked with people such as Colin Thompson, Sean Tan, and I did a cl collaboration with uh, a graffiti artist uh, called Banksy. And I, uh, I'm also a musician, filmmaker, um, muralist, uh, and I cook. <laughs> <laughs> I cook, uh, and no one's died of my cooking. It's, uh, Okay, so we'll, we'll get Jared to introduce. Jared Thomas. Yeah. Uh, nay, Dr. Jared Thomas. Uh, nay, Wangaja Nukuna Warla. Nay, Manda uh, Amiwara. Uh, uh, nay, nay, Manda uh, Wamma Naku. Mm. So my name is Dr. Jared Thomas. I'm a Nukuna person uh, from the Nukuna language group. Uh, Nukuna means assassin. Um, so my group of people are the assassins and... Uh, we were the people that were given law, whereas our neighbours were given the, the knowledge of environment. Um, our neighbours to the south were given the, the, the knowledge of, of, of the ocean and fishing. Our, our, um, our Ghana neighbours were given the, the knowledge of conference. So we all have different types of uh, range of knowledge. Um, in Nukuna country, it's, we, we have uh, many of the most dangerous snakes in the world. Um, we have many of the most dangerous spiders. We have white pointer sharks. Uh, we have dangerous octopuses. Um, so basically, you need to know your story to survive. Um, the other thing that is very scarce is water, or awi. So a lot of our knowledge relates to, to, to awi, and our major um, ancestor is wabma. And wabma is responsible for water. So water beneath the ground, on top of the ground, and in the sky. So when we think of ourselves, we think of ourselves as three elements. Uh, there's our self as the land, our self as the body, and our self as the spirit. And it's all entwined with our knowledge of water. So um, my family's history, so both my parents are, are Aboriginal and European. Um, so my mother's family comes from central Queensland, and they're Irish, and my father's family comes from Nukana and Nadri, which are in southern 
Australia, and we also have English ancestry. Um, the colonisation experience was very brutal for our family members. Uh, one, one story that shows this example is that my great-grandmother in 1906, when she was 19 years old, she was transported um, from her language group, Nadjeri, through Nukana into Narunga language group. Uh, and when she arrived at kind of like a dormitory, I think, which is the, the First Nations equivalent, um, when she was arrived, she was placed in a building without windows, only a door, to then be um, uh, given, provided some accommodation. She went into labour. She passed out during labour. When she woke up, uh, she, was, she was charged with the murder of her firstborn child. Then she was tr transported again to be trialled for that, for that murder um, in the city. Uh, if she was at home, she would have had a community of, of, um, of sisters and aunties to, to assist her with that childbirth. Um, instead, she was, a tr she was acquitted. She was trialled, she was acquitted, um, which is why I exist today. She went on to have 13 other children. Um, six of which fought in World War II. Uh, I have another remarkable great-great-grandmother uh, who left the, the dormitory or the mission, returned to country and refused to move. Uh, it was when my great-grandfather was born and she needed to go back to country for her medicine, uh, her food, her shelter, her spiritual sustenance. Um, so that's the type of culture, cultural background that I come from. Luckily, when my great-great-grandmother went back to country, there was a precedent set where the, the government returned land to my people. So today, since I've been born, I've been proactive in um, managing over 4,500 hectares of our traditional country. So I'm very lucky and fortunate um, to have been born on country with my family um, and to have that as a, as a real site. So country, family and culture, it's, it's my medicine and it's the medicine of our people and it's what it enables us to, to survive. So as a storyteller, coming from a, a family of storytellers, uh, my job is to tell those stories so that the future generations of Nukuna people um, can prosper into the future. Thanks, Jared. And <coughs> Bruce? Pasco up the end. Bruce, just tell us a little bit about yourself. And I'm a uh, Bruce Pasco, Banla by Bunro, by Yuan, Garanji Yuan. Kindaji Nich, Pijar Nala. My family are, are from Tasmania. Um, around the Port Phillip Bay in Victoria, Australia, and um, uh, some are from the south coast of New South Wales. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, the First Nation people of this land. I'd also like to acknowledge how warmly welcomed we've been in Washington, and I'd like to acknowledge the people who signed. Uh, both of my parents were profoundly deaf, and uh, I appreciate this. I'm interested to see how you sign that. <laughs> um, my family, um, my father was a bit of a travelling man and he took us all over the place uh, looking for work. Um, he was a good worker, he was a qualified builder, but he was uh, a restless man. And uh, I had the advantage, therefore, of living in some pretty remote, uh, pretty different parts of Australia. And in each place, um, there were family of ours there. Um, we didn't know that because our family survived in Tasmania in particular uh, by, by denying their Aboriginality. They were uh, fair people, um, so it was easy for them to be absorbed into the, uh, the mainstream community and thus survive. Um, I can't criticise them for that because if you've got children which they had, you have to find a way that those kids are going to live on. And that's what they did. That was a decision they made. Um, I can't judge it. I don't think anyone can judge that decision. I've been... Um, my family of storytellers, I, 
always remember when the aunts and uncles had come around, uh, the, the house would be roaring with laughter because they were all telling jokes and some of those jokes could go for a day and a half. Um, <laughs> and so I, I learnt the long story, um, how to tell a long story. And, and I was a, a book reader as a child. My grandmothers uh, both gave me books as presents and um, I was a listener. So I learnt, I guess, the art of storytelling. Um, and I don't, I'd always try not to make uh, writing stories and novels sound too highfalutin because basically it doesn't matter what novel you write, what short story you write, what opera you write, you're telling a story. And if you don't tell a story, people stop reading it. Uh, so I see it as a sacred craft and particularly in um, Aboriginal society, um, I, it's, I see it as a sacred duty and many of my elders, and it's hard to believe that I could have elders, um, uh, <laughs> many of my elders have always encouraged me to tell those stories because uh, for one reason or another, many of our old people didn't get an education and um, did not have the facility to write. Uh, so for them to be able to tell their story to someone and have that story told into the into the Australian nation, which is a pretty racist place, I must say. Um, it, it was great for them. And um, all of our fellow writers uh, have contributed to that. Cathy at the far end up there is a writer in her own right um, and ought to be writing more, but instead she's facilitating the work of other writers. Uh, in the it's session, the mother in me. In the session before this, uh, she started telling a story about the uh, occupation of Sydney. It was a great story and it was beautiful to listen to, to have our people's story told. It is a story which needs to be told. Um, and that's my story. <laughs> um, it's interesting because that storytelling is, is so strong in our culture and, and, you know, it's the way that all cultures pass down wisdom. It, it's your family stories and your wisdom comes out and, you know, the importance of grandparents. Um, my own father um, was a prolific storyteller. His stories would go for days too. And in fact, the influence of American um, culture on us, his nickname was Uncle Remus. Um, so we used to, you know, we'd go, who the hell's Uncle Remus? But <laughs> um, it wasn't until you get older and you realise uh, who Uncle Remus was. Um, but the three panellists that we've got up here today um, have all written um, for young adults. And um, literacy rates in our, in our people um, are quite low. Um, we're not big readers. Um, we're, because we come from an oral um, history, it's been extremely hard. Um, and, it, you know, it, these days we were talking about, you know, the importance of education in the last um, panel. We need our kids to be reading and writing. So we had to, you know, we have to now look at our stories that are coming through books and films and um, other, other forms of art. Uh, we have to make sure that our young people are, um, are getting those stories again um, through that. So I'm going to start off with um, Jared maybe to have a chat about um, uh, his book Calypso. Thanks, Cathy. Yeah, so I'm going to speak about a book called Calypso Summer, which uh, was released in uh, um, 2014. So with uh, Calypso Summer, it's about a, it's about a young Nukuna man who adopts Rastafarian, um, a Rastafarian uh, persona. And uh, in Australia, it's a real challenge um, in, terms of, in terms of young people maintaining culture. So American culture is more read readily accessible to some Aboriginal kids than what their own family members are. And when we look at, um, when we look at illiteracy, etc. Uh, and so th the impetus for writing the book was criticism of young Aboriginal people uh, being enthusiastic about American hip hop music. And I thought that was quite a con contradiction coming from Aboriginal elders that really loved Chuck Berry and Little Richard, and Fats Domino. And Johnny Cash. And, and Johnny Cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and then, the, then the kind of next generation that were into Donna Summer, um, 
and and then the next generation into Prince and Michael Jackson, etc. So there's always been a black international influence on Aboriginal Australia. And, and lots of that is very positive. And there was a real absence of role models within, within uh, mainstream media in Australia. But what we did have when I was a child was the West Indian cricket team and, and Bob Marley, who was prolific. And um, these, these people become role models to us about how to succeed um, and also fighting uh, political struggles. So Calypso is a young man that, that adopts uh, some of those influences. I just I don't know if Americans know what cricket is. Do you all know? Oh, you yes. do? Good. Okay. <laughs> it was 39 degrees. My boss hadn't paid me and I was too broke to fix my piece of shit 10 speed. A woman in a skirt and bikini, bikini top swung around the corner and quickly sidestepped out of my way. People are always doing that type of thing to me. It's not my dreadlocks that freak people out. It's because I'm black, and I ain't even that black. Just black enough for people to notice. I was just cruising home from work. It's not like I was wearing my prison overalls. I looked all right. I was in my work clothes and my deadly new Pumas. Same one Usain Bolt wears, and he's the fastest man in the world. I couldn't wait to just slide down in the air conditioning. Shane, my next door neighbour's kid, was standing in the driveway smoking a cigarette. The dickhead thinks it's tough. Hey Calypso, I've got some good gear man. You want to buy a bag? He said, keen to make some bundo and have some company. Ah oh, man, you know I don't get wasted no more, I told him. Just have a smoke, see what you think. Man, if I want a gunja, I'd have gunja. I've got way better things to do. I kept walking. Just one smoke, he called out. I kept thinking about the air conditioning and told Shane to piss off. You're a fake Calypso. What kind of ruster don't smoke weed? <laughs> Shane said before skulking back into his mum's place, his Australia flag boardies almost falling off his runty little ass. I didn't smoke gunja for ages, but I could smell it coming from my flat as I turned the key in the door. Rum was in his room trying to smoke away his worries as usual. The air conditioning was deadly when it hit me, but it didn't help my mood. I was pissed off with rum, using all my electricity. I'd finally got my own place, with my Bob Marley poster pinned up in the lounge, a TV and a DVD uh, from cash converters, a couch, <laughs> a couch and a fridge from the Salvation Army, even a washing machine. But it wasn't me that was lapping it all up, rum was. I threw the backpack on the couch, I made my way to Ron's room. I called out to him before I walked in. He'd been real depressed, you know. If he tried doing anything stupid, I didn't want to walk in on that scene without warning. There was no answer, so I waited a tick. I heard his smoker's cough and then walked in. Ron was lying on his mattress, flat on his back, just wearing track pants. His hands were folded beneath his messy black hair that was starting to dread like mine. People think me and Ron are brothers, but he's my cousin, and he's shorter and more solid than me anyway. He's also a few years younger. White people shit themselves when they see Ron, because he has these little scars on his face and freaky green cat eyes that make him look wild and suspicious. He's taken so many drugs that you just can't trust him, even when he's smiling. It's like he might just try to flog you at any time, but I also know he can be one of the most solid, solid fellas going. So I'll just leave it there. So that's Calypso's world and um, the contrast with his cousin, Ron. Um, so, yeah, Calypso is uh, sent on a quest where he, he needs, he's told by his employer, he gets work in a, in a health food store and Calypso calls that store Mystic Dolphins, okay, it's selling the, all these types of new age products. and. Um, there's a real mystification of Aboriginal people in Australia. And uh, his employ employer thinks uh, that his, his family are a particular way. And Calypso's quite ashamed that he doesn't know much about his culture. So he's sent back, um, uh, he, he, he meets with his family, and through, uh, through finding about, out about medicines, um, he comes to find that his family and his culture 
are his medicine. So it really takes uh, the reader, the non-Indigenous reader, through um, towards an understanding of what my Aboriginal culture actually is. And the influences. Thanks, Jared. Um, might go to you, Bruce Pasco. Um, Bruce won the Prime Minister's Award in 2012. 13. 13. Jeez, I'm way beyond. Uh, 2013 for uh, his novel, um, his young adult novel called Fogger Docks. Thanks, Cathy. Um, Fogger Docks is about a, a, a fox that is raised by a dog. Um, and thus the, the fox thinks it's a dox. Uh, I, I wrote this book for myself. Uh, I had a few stories that I, I wanted to tell and they were precious to me because they were all family stories. I, didn't, I had no expectation. I've written 30 books, 29 books, I'm lying again, um, 29 books and um, I thought of all the books this would be the last one to be published uh, because it was um, a kind of an indulgence. My wife has a story about horses, um, riding uh, a life and death story about horses r riding through uh, the Alpine country in, in uh, Australia. My daughter uh, was an on oncology nurse and she lost a lot of patients. Uh, she wasn't very good. Oh, no, no, just gammon. Um, <laughs> but th there were a lot of deaths. She was only a kid. She was 18, 19, so she was ringing me um, and ostensibly uh, talking about when she was going to come and see me and all that sort of stuff. But really what she was saying was, I've lost another patient you know, talk me through it. So she told me these fabulous stories about these brave little children, um, how they battled on and how they lost. Some of them succeeded, but a lot of them lost. And um, I always thought, gee, I'd, lo I'd love to tell that story. Well, I had nowhere to, nowhere to tell it. I'd love to tell my wife's story. I'd love to tell the story of how when I was about 27 and uh, I'd been playing a lot of football so I was surrounded by uh, tough, rough men. Um, mostly good people because 90% of people are mostly good. Um, they were good people but they were tough people. And I was, I went down to the country which I, um, uh, I found a, a place which resonated with me and I, I found out later on that that is actually my country, my people's country, part of it. And I met some old men, old Aboriginal men in the bush. They were timber cutters. A lot of Aboriginal people used to be involved in forestry work um, in those days. And these old guys lived in the bush in houses they'd made themselves out of the, out of the, product, the waste product from the timber felling. And... Um, but they were the most gentle men I'd ever seen. And they, they were also the strongest men I'd ever seen, the toughest, most resilient people I'd ever seen, and yet they were so gentle. They went out of their way to have birds living in their house, owls and little finches and scrub wrens would be in and out of their house all the day, and they would coo and bill. These old men would coo and bill to these birds in language. I thought they were the sweetest old fellas I'd ever met. And I thought, how can I ever tell that story? You know, where's the opportunity to tell that story? And so I, I, I blended all these stories in, into uh, Fogger Docks and um, thinking, well, I'm just doing this for myself. I'm going to get these stories from my family, put them into the one book, and I'll, I'll, I'll put it aside. And my, um, uh, my daughter uh, sabotaged my plan and, um, <laughs> uh, you know, we eventually got picked up by a terrific publisher in Australia called Mugabala Press. Um, I had a terrific editor there. In fact, I've been published by Penguin Books, um, uh, uh, some international presses, and Mugabala sells 15% less books than Penguin does, but I'm prepared to wear that loss because to work with Aboriginal editors um, Aboriginal booksellers, um, Aboriginal uh, publicists, it's, it's a joy and a huge relief because I don't have to explain my culture every five minutes of the day. If I write something about culture, 
in a book, I don't get grilled about it. In an, another novel I wrote called Bloke, which was published by one of the world's biggest publishers, um, there's a section in there where an old lady uh, talks politics. And I was told by the editor that that's impossible. An old, uneducated woman could not talk like that. Um, and I can assure you that that two pages of, um, in Fogadox, uh, in um, Bloke, um, is word for word, absolute ridgy ditch. Um, and I'm almost, I've got a little bit of time to read a, a short have, piece. You have. Good on you, Kath. Look at me and when I go like that, <laughs> yeah, stop. Yeah. <laughs> so the secret is don't look at her. Yeah. <laughs> and this is um, from toward the end of the, this novel. It's about a little sick girl um, in hospital with cancer. She's not um, in very good shape at all. But she's, uh, she wants to know about birds. She wants to know about the bush. And so she's been given this opportunity by these old gentlemen. And yet she was thrilled with the things a child would be thrilled by. The beauty of birds and animals. The hectic glory of the country. To be thrilled was to be alive, and she was thrilled. Albert was saved from further questioning by catching two lovely perch and a blackfish. Tiger put them in the coals of the fire and told Colin to take Dave and Maria to get some yabbies. This is a big extended Aboriginal family. They're all down on the riverbank fishing and eating. Colin rode them in silence across the river while the rainbow birds stitched threads of vibrant colour about them. Look. Colin said at last, look, there's Bunjil looking at us, eagle. Maria looked where he pointed and there was a wedge-tailed eagle weaving great lazy circles in the sky. That's our spirit bird. When we see him, everything's all right. Everything, Maria thought to herself, but couldn't help admiring the huge bird wheeling the giant circles around the sun. And on the other side of the river, they pulled in the yabby pots and tipped the catch into a bucket. Fog speared into the bucket with obvious distaste for such spiky, clawy, scratchy-looking things. But they tasted terrific. Tiger, Tiger tipped them into a kerosene tin of boiling water and soon they were eating a meal of fish and yabbies, fresh damper, with, while the orioles and shrike thrushes called about them. The shrike thrush entered the camp, his head tipped to one side inquiringly while keeping an eye on the dog and the fox. Albert tipped the bird some crumbs of damper. Yaren, we call that one. He's a good bird. Lovely to have one around the camp, you know. He's a good friend of our people. He'll sing for us later. He's got a beautiful voice. They drank more tea and dozed in the sun, mesmerised by the fragrant smoke from the red gum wood. Deeply satisfied by the food they'd eaten, Queenie Bess was already asleep with her head on Dave's boot, while Fog and Brim were like bookends against the frail little girl. I'm going to remember this forever, Maria said to herself, and she did. You didn't see my signal. <laughs> I wasn't looking, sis. <laughs> um, uh, Bruce used a couple of um, Australian terms there, so I thought I'd better let you know. He used the word damper. It's a traditional Aboriginal bread that's cooked in the coals. Um, these days we cook it in the oven, but um, traditionally it was cooked in the coals. He also talked about playing footy. I know you can't imagine it, but he did. And he played a, what they call Australian rules. Um, and Australian rules um, is based or... A, is derived, originates from an, an Aboriginal game called Mangook, and it's um, the most popular football code in Australia. I shouldn't say that because I'm from up north. Yeah, well, Richmond won yesterday. Richmond beat North <laughs> Melbourne. And we have warned him I hope not you to wear his football that. colours into, um, into <laughs> onto the panels. <laughs> um, and, OK, so now we've got um, Dub. Have you... Do you want to do a bit of a reading and have a chat? We call Dub our, um, well, I call Dub our romantic. <laughs> um, Thanks. I, I call He's him always my, giving love out. I call him tech support because he helps me with my computer. Oh, that's, that's love. I've been called worse. 
I, uh, yes, yeah, so a few years ago, uh, with the same publisher, Magabala, uh, who punched above their weight, I, uh, I wrote and illustrated this book, uh, Once It Was a Boy. Um, now, do, do you want to hear some, some of the story first and then the story, or do you want to hear the story? I reckon hear the story because then it'll give them. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm ordering you to do the story. Let's see. Yes. Thanks. And just before he starts, Thanks, the, the three of these writers are published by Magabala Books. It's an Aboriginal publishing house. It's the most remote publishing house in um, the world. It's up in a, a place that I call Paradise, Broome. Um, and um, they have been, uh, how old are they now? About 25. 25 yes. years. Yeah. And they've been producing all these stories. They set themselves up to preserve Aboriginal stories of the Kimberley area mm. in Australia. But they now take on... Um, you know, lots of other creative writing from around Australia. Yeah, so I... Uh, mm, yeah, I, we, we talk about uh, the Stolen Generations. Do you guys know about the Stolen Generation? If a little bit. Rabbit Proof a little bit. Or... Rabbit Proof is a good starting point. I, uh, I'm one step removed, as in I, I was adopted out by my mum and uh, from day dot which happens to be uh, the 1st of January so there's always a big party on my birthday and I uh, yeah, spent 62 days in hospital and uh, they'd actually given me, I was there so long they gave me another name, my name was Joshua and the nurses wanted to keep me apparently and then I was adopted out on March 3rd and so I grew up with a, um, uh, with a uh, white Australian family. And they're still my family. They are they're my family. And so I, I, I grew up without culture. And so when you, 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 you don't have anything, uh, you know, you value it more when you can see it from a distance. So I... Um, but that didn't stop me from hanging around other Aboriginal people and... Um, that was always uh, prevalent in my life. And uh, I'm, I ended up meeting my family when I was 25, uh, which uh, yeah, changed. And Kathy and I were just talking. We've been talking the last couple of days, and we, I'd say we are related. We've discovered that we've probably got yeah. common yeah, Unfortunately, My grandparents yeah, and <laughs> raised, raised a family that were his uncles and aunties. Yeah, quite, yeah very close ties. And... Uh, so you know, I, I've so I've seen uh, both worlds, and uh, and I, I you know you sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly, you are forced to live in those worlds. And I, I I've met a lot of other Aboriginal adoptees, and our story is always different. And uh, so I um, so f for five years I started working on this book. And so there's, there's el it's a on a simple level, it's for children, and um, you know there's truth in here, and there's, it's about friendship and ownership, and uh, and dealing with consequence, and there's also there's, polit there's the, po the politics that um, adults can see, and uh, that way you know the. Uh, all ages can get something out of the book. So would you guys like to hear a little? Uh, you usually get the audience to do sound effects. So. <laughs> Double so illustrated this book. Um, so once there was a boy who lived on an island. He lived there all by himself. He lived in an ancient boat made from an ancient tree right on the beach. Who can do the sound of wind? <laughs> You're a fantastic crowd. <laughs> You've done this before, I can tell you. Every morning he got up and picked fruit. 
His favourite fruit was called sapoti, and it tasted just like chocolate. Have you guys heard of sapoti? It's, I think it's, it's in Mexico, and uh, I think they spell it with a Z, a Z. And it does taste like chocolate. They're actually growing in my backyard. He loved climbing in the mangrove trees and watching the sunlight up the sea. Can anyone do the sound of sun? No. <laughs> I'm doing it, Doug. <laughs> just, just show off you. <laughs> One day, as he was sitting high in the mangrove tree eating some sapotis, he looked down the beach and he saw something moving. A little, a little speck coming closer and closer down the beach someone else here on the island hello came a little voice hello said the boy who are you he asked I'm a girl said the girl below the mangrove tree the boy dropped all his sapotis in fright. One of them landed in the girl's hand and she took a huge bite. Oh, these sapotis are delicious. Mm. Yum. And she ate all the sapotis up one by one. <laughs> Eating all that fruit has made me sleepy. Can I? Can I sleep up there? She asked, pointing to the ancient boat made from the ancient tree. Before the boy could answer, the girl had climbed up and fallen fast asleep in his softest hammock. Hmm, he thought, watching her sleep. He watched her as it became dark. He watched her all through the night. He wondered what would happen in the morning. Would she stay? Before first light, he crept out. Who can do the sound of crickets? <laughs> Bruce. It's beyond him. Thank you. <laughs> the girl woke up to find herself alone. There was a note on the table. Should I go on? You are a fantastic crowd. The note said, Good morning. I hope you had a good sleep. I've gone to the other side of the island to get some more sapotis for breakfast. I'll be back soon. Make yourself at home. <gasps> P.S. Don't look under my bed. Shall I continue? Yes, because we all know right, that right, right, wouldn't right. be able to stand that. <laughs> the girl's imagination started jumping up and down. What could be under his bed? No, no, I must, I must not look. I must not look. Not even a tiny little peak, she thought. Mm. Soon she found herself kneeling down under the boy's bed. There, tucked away up in the dark, was an old box. It was a strange box. It was small and was made from wood. The girl touched it and then she pulled it out from under the bed. The thump came a sound inside the box. The thump, the thump, the thump. The little girl jumped back in fright. Ha! It didn't sound like... Who was that laughing up there? Mum? Was that you? <laughs> she, she jumped on the box and then it unlocked. The girl's eyes opened wide for there inside there was a heart and it was beating. Yeah, faster. Oh, okay. I'm getting the signal. The thump, the thump. The thump went the heart. The thump. I've never been this close to a boy's heart before. She, she thought. She decided to pick it up. 
and as the girl held the boy's heart in her hands, the boy came bursting through the door, saying, Good morning! Startled, she dropped it. And broke it. So I'll stop there. <laughs> So you have to get the book now to see what happens to that heart. Um, we've got some time for questions. Um, if people, no, no, we're oh no, we're not. No. I thought you were giving me the. Oh no, the signal. that's all my well, fault. Um, just that stolen generations that uh, we talk about, and, and it comes through a lot of our stories. Um, in Australia, there was um, actual official policy to remove Aboriginal children from their families. Um, it didn't just happen in a period of time, it actually started uh, within the first 15, 20 years of, of um, colonisation in Australia. They built a, a place called the Native Institute and they thought if they removed children into there, one is that they would assimilate but they wanted them to become like uh, them so that they would learn to read and write. And there are some fantastic stories of, of survival out of those, those things. And then you saw, of course, um, the rabbit proof fence which is another experience of stolen generation but um, when it was at its peak one in three Aboriginal children were removed from their families and um, it's been an ongoing battle um, of between a conflict that was there between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people because it was not acknowledged that this is what past Australian governments and, and current Australian governments are still doing. Aboriginal kids are still being removed. In fact, in New South Wales, they're being moved at a higher rate than what they were back in the peak of stolen generations. So a lot of these stories, um, you know, come um, with a lot of heart. Do you want to keep coming? How long have we got? No, we're over time. Oh, sorry. So if you want any questions, I think if you could just um, have a quick ask the boys. I mean, two of them are coming back up here again, but we won't, don't want to um, afterwards. Do you want to mingle or talk? So thanks for coming, and we'll just let you do that so we're not running over time. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.